like to call the meeting to order, oh, God, that took long. please. Okay. And I would like to welcome everyone and all members of the public as well as the um, all trustee trustees. So I will now read the electronic meeting script. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance, this library board of trustees needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record audibility of members' voices. First, because each member of this library board of trustees is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all the other members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each library board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear each of your col colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. So I will start with Bill and Springfield. Bill Rosenthal in my office in Alexandria, Virginia. Great. Um, Liz Walker, Sully. She's not here yet. I don't think I, I don't see her. I have seen her. Priscilla, school board or school. Hi, Priscilla Dando um, at home in Woodbridge. Okay. Gary Russell, Mount Vernon District. Gary Russell in Mount Vernon at home. Thank you. Keith Fox, Lee District. Yes, good evening. Keith Fox uh, in my home in Springfield. Sheila Janaga, Hunter Mill District. Sheila Janaga at home. Thank you. Preston. Sujatha of Drainsville. Just Sujatha Hampton. Sujatha Hampton at home in Great Falls, Virginia. Thank you. Suzanne Levy, Fairfax City. Suzanne Levy from my home in the city of Fairfax. Jane Miscavige at large. Um, Jane Miscavige at home in Vienna. Miriam Smolin, Providence. Uh, Miriam Smolin in Fairfax at my home. Brian Angler, Braddock. Brian Angler in Burke, Virginia at my home. And Fred Millenhelzer, Mason District from my home. Okay, at this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to the vice chair so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of this library board of trustees. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Fran. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the motion is passed. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this board to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting and that as such, FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of this board and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this board may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated Zoom meeting and that the public access this meeting by, and I do not have that address in front of me right now. Does, do I have, do we need to have that to be read? Does, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second, but I have a point of order. Yes. I suggest that you uh, speak to Liz. She's now on the phone and get her into the quorum. Oh, okay, the great. Um, but first let's approve this oh. and then I'll do right. that. Okay. Okay. Because we're in the middle of it. Okay. So we have a set, we have the motion on the floor with a second and um, we need a vote. All those in favor, please. Aye. 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 Sorry, my phone is going off. <laughs> okay, stop. And I will go back to the uh, roll call. And uh, Liz Walker, uh, Sully District. Yes, um, Liz Walker calling from home. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was late. Okay, so now we're ready to need to dispense with FOIA's usual procedures. Finally, it is next required that all the matters addressed on today's agenda must address the emergency itself, are necessary for continuity in Fairfax mm -hmm. County government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of this board's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. It is so moved. Do I have a second? Bill, second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And um, now I can take the gavel back. <laughs> and the meeting can begin with public comment. Uh, let's see. The library board wishes to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on library related issues. It is our policy to hear a maximum of five speakers at each regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are limited to one public comment during a six month period. Each speaker has a maximum of three minutes for their comments. A 30 second warning will be given before each speaker's time is up and the speaker will be expected to end promptly when time is called. Speakers are requested to pre-register with the library director. However, if there are available public comment slots open at the time of a board meeting, the remaining slots may be filled by individuals registering at the meeting. Board members will not question or respond to the speakers. And tonight there are no registered speakers. And if anyone wishes to speak at a future meeting, call the director's assistant at 703-324-8324. Okay. Okay, hey, now we're ready for our presentation. And tonight, um, Mary Nakashima from the Thomas Jefferson uh, Library is going to be speaking to us and um, telling us about the program um, that they have instituted at Thomas Jefferson. Um, she previously worked as a librarian for 15 years at several urban libraries of the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. And at TJ, she has been focused on overhauling the children's and teens area and revamping youth program programming to meet the needs of the underserved communities, especially the um, Hispanic families. Before the pandemic, she loved to travel everywhere from exploring local DC area to flying back to visit her family in Brazil, where she grew up. And she can't wait to start traveling again once the pandem pandemic is over. I feel exactly the same way. I don't have an exotic home. <laughs> I grew up in Ohio, but still, <laughs> it would be nice to be planning a trip, wouldn't it? But I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation about what's going on in TJ. So Mary, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Mary Nakashima, and I'm the children's librarian at the Thomas Jefferson Community Library. Give me a second, please, to share my screen. Ooh. Uh, I'm getting a notice saying that host disabled participants screen sharing. Christine, you probably have to give Mary permission to share or or put up her um, material for her. Yeah, I think Bobby Bobby just gave her permission. Thank you. Okay, great. Try again. All right, good. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about our Reading Buddies program that went online with the name Reading Help Online, Ayuda de Lectura, when the libraries closed in March with the pandemic. Our primary goal with this program is not teaching reading strategies, though we do help students with sounding out letters, vocabulary, and comprehension. Our goal is not to be a reading tutor, though kids in our program make significant improvements in their skills. We are librarians in the children's library. Our main goal is to develop lifelong readers and library users. This program connects children and their families with amazing books that can be found in a public library. We want to match students with a book they enjoy, get them excited about books and about reading. As a frontline branch staff, my target audience has always been focused on that potential library user from underserved communities who will mostly benefit from all the resources found in a public library. Children with learning differences from non-traditional families or environments where English is not the primary language, families on the other side of the digital divide. Potential library user who is not aware of all the free resources offered by the public library, who don't know that librarians and library staff are here to support their children's learning their growth and success. 
As you know, this goal is something we share with the One Fairfax policy. Whenever we are launching a new program, what is in my mind is to prioritize thoughtful approaches that will advance racial and social equity among families in our service areas. That's why when Fairfax Libraries closed in March and staff started teleworking and planning virtual programs, I decided to bring back the Reading Buddies program, which I had been previously conducting for more than a decade. But this time virtually, it would be different. High school volunteers wouldn't be helping elementary students one-on-one -on -one after school in the children's library. Instead, Pam Snyder and I, the staff of the TJ Children's Library, while teleworking would be the reading buddies. As recommended by the One Fairfax policy, we went very ambitious about promoting this program. Beyond just posting on the library's website, we actually contacted all 141 elementary schools in Fairfax County, because in the virtual environment, we were not limited to the brand service area. We also re reached out to several Hispanic community groups in Fairfax. 150 families signed up for the program. Pam and I were connecting with an average of 12 students daily, sharing our laptop screens loaded with juvenile eBooks from Overdrive, delighted to share the joy of reading with these kids and families. One issue we faced early on was the registration process. Families were signing up on the wait list of that specific event link that I had sent to schools and community groups. And the link was for just one session on a specific day and time that could accommodate only two students, one for Pam and one for me. So to coordinate all the intake and schedule of students, I created a registration page with Microsoft Forms and an Excel file. The second issue we encountered was the cap on ebook checkouts in Overdrive. Limited to only 10 ebooks per library account, it was difficult to serve students from kindergarten through sixth grade with different reading levels and interests. So we created four different library accounts and constantly managed holds searched for available beginning reader ebooks, which over the spring were mostly checked out. The third issue was to have all four accounts opening Overdrive at the same time so that we could quickly show the students, these are the books we have for you today. Which one would you like to read? Mm -hmm. And being able to switch from one account to the next without needing to sign out and sign in. And that was not possible with Overdrive because it didn't allow multiple accounts opening the same browser. My solution to this was to use the Firefox container tabs extension, as you see here. While we were happy to have reached so many families and figured out workarounds on these early obstacles, a major roadblock remained, the digital divide. Families that most needed this program were on the other side of the digital gap. As I heard from one assistant principal, how could this program support students who did not have broadband at home? And even for some of those with Wi-Fi at home, their connections were too slow to hold a video call with us. And to magnify the issue of the digital gap, the library Zoom account was not allowed for one-on-one -on -one events like this. Mm -hmm. So we had to figure out how to connect through other virtual meeting platforms, such as Skype and Google. That meant spending hours calling and texting <laughs> in Spanish back and forth with the parents, helping them with setting up a Skype or Google account on their devices. All this happened in brand staff were teleworking. In the summer, all brand staff had to return to the libraries for the reopening. We paused the program throughout summer to reassess. 
During the reassessment period, some of the roadblocks, roadblocks were removed and we resumed the program just recently with a slightly modified format and name, Virtual Reading Buddies Ayuda de Lectura. This fall, FCPS has provided students with portable Wi-Fi hotspots fast enough to connect with our video calls. Each branch now has their own licensed Zoom account, so we can now just send the Zoom link without needing to set up a Skype or Google account. We also now have some of the high school volunteers from last year back virtually, allowing multiple elementary students in one Zoom session paired up in breakout rooms. And we got Bob books in Overdrive, which are essential for beginning readers, not just for us in the Reading Buddies program, but for everyone searching for those resources in Fairfax County. And that's our program. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And you're always welcome to email me if there is anything else I can answer for you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Of the dozen or so students you had in one day, each of those sessions was a separate one-on-one -on -one session? Exactly, yes. So we had 20 to 30 minutes per student. So basically we were all day um, you, helping You students. amaze me that, that yeah. all the staff, the librarians are great. Yes, Thank but you. now we have uh, the Zoom account, so yeah. we can help multiple students in breakout rooms, yeah. yes. Great. Yeah. That's amazing. It's a, what a wonderful program. Incredible. Very, very uh, work intensive, but so um, productive. Sujatha, did you uh, have a? Yeah, I wanted, first I wanted to say, I'm just in awe, you know, as a teacher <laughs> myself, as a, as a reading specialist, as a, I'm just, I can't tell you how this is just spectacular. And, you know, I'm a new board member. I didn't even realize until I joined that we had a board of trustees. So I'm so grateful to the amazing work of these, of, of Fairfax County Public Libraries. I can't even believe this. I Last month we talked about like the, the, um, the One Fairfax initiatives that are being put forth. This is the embodiment of One Fairfax right here for children during a time when everything catastrophically failed from federal on down that we just had a total shutdown and you managed to pull this back up. I'm, I just wanted to say how every problem that you, it was lovely to see. You ran into a problem, you solved that problem. Run into the next problem, problem that so solved that problem. I mean, that's the kind of thing that just makes everything work. It's the only thing, it's, it's a shame that we require that. And yet when people step up, so this was ex exceptional. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I have one more thing just in, in relation to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I am impressed too with, with how you solve those problems. You seem to indicate that most of them have been solved. I know you would normally talk to the staff about this, but as a member of the board of trustees, I'm interested, is there anything else that the system or that we could do to help make this work better? And Christine, you're welcome to step in too if you have any comments on that. At we, we in the Children's Library, we always welcome all the support you can give us for programming and resources and collection because children are the future, are the future of public libraries. Right. Yeah. And Sheila? Mary, um, yeah, this is, I, this is just an incredible program. So you contacted the principals of the schools in Fairfax County. And then how did the children from across the county tap into this incredible Reading Buddy online program while we were closed? So I contacted all school principals and librarians and I sent the link to the event that was posted uh -huh. on the library's website. Yes. Um, but that link was specific for that day. You know, yes. we were offering every day. So I offered, for example, Monday. Yeah. To talk. Um, many families, those that managed to go to that link and sign up, mm -hmm. um, 
that's the they couldn't scroll and look for another date that would be more convenient to them. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at the wait list of that date was just dozens of people signed up. Um, and we knew that they were all interested. They were not just interested for that specific time and date. So that's why I had to create the forms and the Excel files to be able to schedule them. Right. And I contacted them um, to verify what date would work for them. Amazing. And I just have one more yes. question. Now you're from TJ. Do you find that most of your reading buddies are from your area or, or does it go across the system? Have enough other libraries found you, other branches? Yes, now it's all over Fairfax County. Okay, um, I was gonna ask we that. just, yeah, we just did, uh, we're doing that. Uh, today was the reading, uh, virtual reading buddy session. And um, yes, the students were not limited to those schools assigned to TJ. And just one last question, are other libraries joining in with this? So you have help from other children's librarians across the county? Um, or is not it just yet. you? Not yet. That's a wow, what a big job. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Fran, I think oh, Priscilla. Okay, and I, I got your, question. yeah. Uh, who was next, Phil or Priscilla? Priscilla. Priscilla. I just have one brief comment. Why are you with Parking Mirror? And I just wrote down like very creatively. There'd be no way in the world I could have figured out how to do one tenth of what you were able to accomplish. And so thank you very, very much for her efforts in, in this program. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I felt the same way. <laughs> Priscilla, I think you might've had a question or comment. Yes, thank you. I wanted to add on to what uh, Dr. Hampton had said in the sense that we're, we are searching always for ways to make connections on the individual level with students and with the huge district that we have, um, having you work and your partner work with families individually so that they can find success no matter what is what everybody is, should be doing. Um, and unfortunately, we don't always have that kind of dedication. So I just want to say um, how much I personally appreciate. And I also want to say on behalf of the school system that we would we appreciate the opportunity to have you spend so much of your creativity and energy and dedication to the betterment of our students in Fairfax County, as well as our families. And it's things like this that show families that people care and are thinking about them when so much of our lives can be invisible to each other um, during uh, something like the pandemic. And I also wanted to offer that if you need any assistance at all, if you need me to communicate on mass with people, if you need me to um, identify additional volunteers for you or in any way assist in the connection with Fairfax County Public Schools, I really want to uh, make sure that you, uh, you are aware that I will do anything I can to support you because like I said, it's, it's time and labor intensive and it takes a lot of um, grit, honestly, to be persistent enough to solve everyone's um, obstacles that may come in the way. But that's what gives us the biggest impact. This is not a checkbox program. This is a program that makes a difference. And I just wanna thank you for that. Thank you so much. Is anybody else that I missed? Suzanne. Liz and myself. Oh, Keith. Yeah. Um, People, everyone's I'm gonna, texting me. I'm <laughs> hi, I'm gonna be brief because I, I don't wanna repeat everything that the board members have already stated, but I hopefully you are seeing me nodding my head in approval and clapping and everything else because um, what, you're, what you're doing I think needs to be duplicated. And one of the notes I wrote down is, you know, yes. is there, should you be, should we be developing a training program for what you're doing? Um, because it, you know, I, I think the popularity of it may get a bit cumbersome and Priscilla talked about, you know, how, how, how much you have in your hands. I was very, very, very pleased with how you, you uh, came up against obstacles and then punched through it with, yeah different solutions. And I mean, that's what the world needs. Uh, last thing is a, a question I had for you, Mary. You mentioned about having multiple library accounts and I, I didn't understand what solution you were solving there. I didn't understand it. So I'm, I'm asking for a little feedback on that. 
Um, each library account allows only 10 ebook checkouts. Mm -hmm. So we created multiple accounts to have at least 40 books available for the kids because we were serving kids from kindergarten through sixth grade. Okay, so you needed, you needed access to the 40 books. So you right, and that was the only way. We as staff, we don't have preference in OverDrive. We are just like a resident with a okay. library account. Okay. So that Thank was the you know, way around to have more than you know, 10, the limit of 10 books available for the kids because we want we show them the page and say these are the books we have for you which one would you like to read very it's good. very important to offer them that choice and not say okay you know you're going to read this so they get really excited about all the covers all the titles that are available and um, that's that's why we had to have at least four uh, library accounts very well thank you that's all i have thank you thank you Anybody else? Oh, Liz, yeah. Uh, Mary, a great, great program, great uh, activity. I'm not sure I understood correctly. I want to just make sure I understand. You started out in plant at Thomas Jefferson Library. So you physically were doing this in the, the one library facility. And then we went into lockdown. And if I understand correctly, you went online and you expanded it to all of Fairfax County. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, when the libraries were open before the pandemic, we had the teen space. Uh, the, so uh, teens would come to the library to do homework or to hang out in the meeting room. And they were also available to help elementary school kids who needed help with reading. So they would be reading buddies then in the library. Uh -huh. So once uh, the libraries closed and we went uh, online, while teleworking, I want to bring that um, on a virtual environment. Um, I wanted um, to reach out to the kids to say, hey, we are still here and you know, we can help you um, with uh, accessing books somehow and try to read those books. So, if the libraries open up again, uh, the vaccine, everybody takes their vaccine and things open up. The libraries are open right now, yes. Yeah, do you expect you're gonna continue with this as an online uh, program or do you think you're gonna revert back to Thomas Jefferson and encourage all the other libraries to have a similar program going forward? Oh, definitely once it is safe for everyone to come into the library and congregate yes definitely it's uh you know i want uh, i i don't want to do virtual no uh come to the library and interact with uh, the high school students interact with the books or the programs that are or everything that is happening in the library yes so have you heard the other libraries will be doing the same uh, if other libraries are doing this program, doing same, yeah, to open it up and have a physical uh, interactive kind of experience at their library, because you were just doing that at Thomas Jefferson, right? Right. Yes, uh, yes, there are lots of reading buddies um, programs in schools, I believe, even in schools, in libraries, yes, across the country, in other systems, too. yes. Ask you a question, Mary. Yes. Um, just speaking, just reading teacher to reading teacher say, when, if you, um, do you find that you are able to, in the virtual setting, like you said, you would like people come to the library, we'll do this one-on-one. -on -one. I, were you doing it one-on-one -on -one or was it more of a group when it was in person? Were you doing reading buddies as reading buddies one-on-one -on -one, as it usually is, or did you have a group setting and you were working on reading with us? It was one-on-one, -on -one, but not with the librarians, not with the staff. Mm -hmm. It was always uh, with a high school student volunteer I, yeah, you and the elementary school kid. Okay. Yes. So it was reading buddies, like the school program reading buddies. So yes. if that's what you were doing. You just recreated that elementary school program that our you know, kids have volunteered for reading mm -hmm. buddies. It's the same thing. That's what you reinstated. I mean, you yes. put in place virtually. Very nice. So. Um, question because it seems like it's possible and of course I'm not trying to put more work onto your plate I'm just asking the question 
uh, to follow up on Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I just trying to say, like you said, you'd like it to, to go back to in person. Is there a way that we could support or just like, cause you know, like, you know, just to follow up on what Keith said, um, you know, we're part of the outreach committee, committee. We talk about things like that. This is just beautiful. And the fact that you've managed to just reach the whole county where maybe there's, there, you know, varying, there have to be varying levels of this kind of availability through the libraries and yeah. through schools. Schools are hurting now. Like, you know, I, in my role as the NAACP education chair, I follow school board all the time. And they are really struggling in every aspect. And scores, I'm sure you've read in the newspaper, scores around the country, or kids are failing, they're getting Ds and F, historic numbers of Ds and F for first semesters, which is why this is so great, what you're doing. I'm wondering if there's some way that we might be able to support an ongoing virtual pro program, because we're looking at not being, having even vaccines, 25% or something like that vaccinated by June, if we're lucky, or less than 25%. There's so little vaccine, we don't know. I would love to be able to talk more about what we could do to support growing this out. Other people, how could we help? Yes, yes. So again, um, we need to reach those potential library users, those that don't know that we have this service in the library, mm -hmm. um, those that mo would most benefit from uh, this program. But at the same time, we have limitations. Yeah. Uh, we don't have, right now, we don't have many high school volunteers. Uh, I'm not sure, I just emailed all the high school principals and librarians uh, to check if there is a community uh, service requirement for any class. Uh, so Mary, I don't hate to interrupt you, but if, if you and I can connect offline, sure. I can make that, that a lot more streamlined and yeah. easier for you. Oh, that would be great. wonderful. That sounds yes. great. Yes, yes, yes. that yes. sounds great. So yeah, there are lots of limitations, the availability of, of high, high school students, uh, availability of staff, it's only, again, Pam and I yeah. and TJ. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we would love to expand. And I think um, other branches are interested in um, hosting uh, this program too. I heard from a few branches. So they can offer in other days too, and maybe they have more staff to, um, to facilitate this program. That's great. I think this has been, an, this was an amazing presentation. And then I think the connections that are being made right now uh, to keep it going, either in the same format or um, adapting as, as things change, as they are changing constantly. Um, and it hits on something that I know we've talked about is the things that we do that are sort of unknown. Um, and then when you hear about them and you're just knocked out, and this is one, this is like out of the ballpark, I think. Uh, so thank you so much for taking time to uh, come and teach us. Uh, about a wonderful program. And by the way, I saw one of my favorite characters, Pete the Cat, on the screen. I love Pete the Cat. <laughs> I, I think you should all reserve a Pete the Cat book. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Christine and Jessica, thank you for booking her because uh, this was a delight. Know, and it was wonderful. <laughs> really okay. Good. Great. Um, I think now it's time to move on to the minutes. Um, does anyone have any um, additions or corrections? Hearing none, do I have a motion to uh, accept? The only thing that I don't want to be technical, but like on the first draft of the thing, it, it, where we did the audible of the last month's meeting, it doesn't have me listed. Later on, I'm listed in the end, so I don't know if that makes any difference or not. That you should be on that list. But no, I, he, he, he wasn't here specifically for the roll call. Right. He came in later. So, so what does that as mean? long what as it mean? acknowledges that he was at the meeting, I think it's okay. But I, can't. I don't have a problem. I just yeah. knew I was at the meeting. <laughs> I think we should make sure that your name is in there because um, it's important that, that, that it's in the minutes that we had full participation. So, um, Maybe a note underneath the, you know, do the roll call, just as it is. I'm looking at yeah. it here. And then later on say, so-and-so joined the meeting in progress because you're, you know, you're not needed for the quorum because we were already in session, but right. you certainly are a member 
and we could vote and everything else. Otherwise, you were here. It, you were here before the public comment, right, Phil? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. how about insert that right about there, Christine and Bobby? Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I didn't yeah, even people, notice that. I mean, I this is an official it. record of the meeting, and so it does really need to be correct of who was here. And you may oh. need to do the same thing with Liz because I'm not sure exactly when she came in. I, I, yeah, she but she was, that's that's why I suggested you yeah. get her into the I call came, and you did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you did. Yeah, you yeah. Ex explicitly I said that. So she got, but I wasn't. Look, I didn't have my gallery view on, and so I things were happening that I didn't see. And people were texting me. My phone was going off. And I was like, "What's going on there?" And I thought, "I need I gallery know. view." Yeah. So, so I, I move that the minutes be approved with the correction that we just discussed. Okay, perfect. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. And all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Minutes. Uh, and now it's time for the chair's report, and I have a very, I have a very short report. Um, I just want to announce um, I have the term standing up an ad hoc uh, committee on the staff on staff excellence awards, and that will be Jay Miscavige and Lynn Walker, and they will be um, working with Christine. And the um, this is the award we started last year to recognize the public service staff. And uh, when they go out of their way or just every day are terrific, which they are. Um, and we have um, application forms in the libraries the first two weeks of February. Uh, and so members of the public can nominate someone. They turn that form in. The forms come to Christine. Then Christine will sit down with Jane and uh, Liz and they will review them and then make their awards, which we will make at the March meeting. And I think, Suzanne, you have a question. Yeah, will they be online for people who are still not comfortable coming into the buildings? And I'm seeing Christine shake her head, yes. Okay, good. Do you want to say anything else, Christine? In fact, we prefer the online submission. Um, we just, last year, we had them paper submissions in case people came into the branch, but it's much easier for us to collate the online submissions. Okay, great. All right, thank you. And then the other thing, I want to call your attention to a sheet that was in the packet uh, last time Liz asked about the overlay of the magisterial districts on um, the uneven opportunity landscape that we that um, we heard about and um, Doug, Doug Miller was able to get that snap like that and there it is and you can look and see your district and um, where those uh, how that how the uh, that impacts you Jane um I love this map and I'm really, um, I, I'm really grateful that we have it. Is it possible, uh, Christine, to have somebody then put the library location on here so we can see? That's your assignment, trustee. No, I'm kidding. Is that my, <laughs> like you ask, then you do it. Little dot with your Sharpie. Yeah. I'm old yeah. school, so I will do it with a Sharpie. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm just <laughs> um, I, uh, May I, I, I was, had a question too, not just about the library location, but the COVID vulnerability index is something I don't really understand and I don't know that it applies to us. The uneven opportunity landscape is what we care about. Is that right? For, for our purposes, I'm trying to understand. I remember the discussion briefly, but when I, I looked at the map, the it looked like- The COVID vulnerability map would certainly impact- yeah. I'm sorry, can you not hear me? You look no, like I can hear you. Okay. I, I, was, I was trying to figure out who was talking. I would, I would ask <laughs> trustees, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up and wait for me to recognize you, okay? And I think Suzanne had her hand up. So yeah. Suzanne. It appears to me the city was left out of this. And I know we have areas on the city. Sorry, I didn't have a set term. Yeah, so I wonder if Doug could talk to the city staff and include the city on this mapping. I will ask him about that, Suzanne. I'm, he had to work with multiple layers of the county to get this done, so I'm not sure, but I will certainly ask him. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I would just like it noted that there are, I'm sure there are, I know there's low income housing in a number of places in the city and we wanna be sure those people are available. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Sajatha, you had a comment or question, yes? Yeah, I was um, just, just remarking to um, Brian's comment that uh, COVID vulnerability, like I can just look in Drainsville, Herndon is a serious hotspot. 
for COVID. We know that versus if you look at the Drainsville map, there is no other uh, uneven anything in Drainsville. But in Herndon, there is not only unevenness, there is also COVID vulnerability, right? So you will find that they are just very much married, right? Yeah. They're very much married. And that, yeah, I mean, that's just an indication of the inequities in our in our system. So certainly if we're talking about things like these reading buddies or any kind of opportunities that we're offering, mm -hmm. we should be thinking right here on this map, we can really see yeah. what we need to see in terms of who needs us most, you know, okay. who's yeah. unable to just order from Amazon or whatever uh, a book yeah. to, to support them or, or having their schools. Yeah. Even yeah. when you're talking about the open schools mm -hmm. argument, um, sometimes that's not even being considered, like what we're talking about with regard to COVID vulnerability and library access. Yeah, I think Keith had his hand up. Keith, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I want to furthermore add that um, some of our libraries are offering COVID testing also. So mm -hmm. that is also a connection here and makes this map very useful. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Jane that I was looking for the library locations, particularly um, when the last speaker was giving her presentation, I was trying to figure out where TJ was in all of this. So um, I further recommend that we add that to the map. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll see how that, I mean, I, I felt we were really lucky that uh, Doug was able to do this. So we're sure. just piling more requests on. <laughs> on everyone. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, so Jeff, no, 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 nobody else? Okay, we're done. Liz, okay, Liz, J Fran. Liz. All right, I missed you. Sorry. I was just going to say I, my original request was to have the libraries included um, so that we could see how close are they for like walking distance and things like that. So um, it would be nice if we could get that. And the second thing is um, in Sully in particular, I think I know where that, where the, uh, what is the green spot by Chantilly, but I really don't know that. Is there any way that these, this area could be defined better by, um, I don't know what it could be, but I'm thinking it might be like Brookfield school area or Brookfield uh, a precinct. Um, I'm just trying to, th my Sully also in the Centerville area has like a gap in there. It's got two screen sections. I think one of them is around the Centerville library, but I don't know if the other one is like in London town area. It would be nice if there were some community names or territory that could give me a little bit better of a focus of what particular area we're talking about. Um, uh, it's not as clear in my mind where exactly those green spots are in, in, in uh, Sully. I don't know if that's possible at all, Christine, but the schools would be, mm -hmm. my original request was to have, you know, the association of the, um, the uneven opportunity landscapes with, this, with the libraries. But now that I see that I have three in Sully, it would be helpful to know <laughs> what can there are so I can look at what schools are also in those areas. You know what I mean? I'm just guessing right now. It's a great question. And I think um, Doug was kind of fighting the idea of making it simple versus too much information. So, you know, so it's clear it's that's tough with maps, but I will, he is an expert at them yeah. and I will definitely take back all this feedback and see what he can do with it. And I'm not, I'm we'll thinking see thinking what's in the scope of, of what's possible, I think mm -hmm. is important um, that, you know, we can't, everything on here. I mean, that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you okay. for the map. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready for um, committee reports. So Suzanne Foundation. Okay, the foundation board met yesterday morning virtually at 930. We spent most of our meeting on financial reports and the accountants uh, report on the, the audit. But the main things I wanted to point out is programming, virtual programming, and the foundation has, has sponsored several programs that have been very effective, as well as they've worked with Fall for the Book. And usually Fall for the Book is a week or 10 days long, and it's still kind of going on. And people are enjoying these online opportunities to hear authors speak and so forth. 
Um, there's my sheet of paper. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, if you want to purchase some of the um, things the foundation is selling, they have color your own face masks and some of the um, uh, tote bags that two of the tote bags have sold out. But if you go to the foundation website, you can take a look at those and have an opportunity to purchase them. Uh, here's my note sheet. Um, and those were the main things I wanted to mention. But there is, you know, just keep an eye on the foundation website. And if anybody wants to see the annual, uh, the uh, financial reports, drop me an email and I'll send you the, the, uh, the reports and you can read them. Okay, That's you. all I have. Thank you. The Unless other thing I is that- major, um, ran. What? Unless I missed something major that- Well, I, I was just gonna announce that um, Miriam Smolin is now um, a director on the uh, foundation board. She was voted in um, at the meeting and I'm sure they'll be piling work on her, uh, probably all the legal work now. No. And she's a full-time voting member. I'm just an ex officio member, so I don't get to vote, but Miriam does. So, so the, the next is the finance committee, which is Miriam. Uh, we did not have a meeting, so it's a very short report in that there isn't one. Okay, thank you. Outreach committee, Brian. Uh, yes, I mentioned last month the uh, winter talking points. You now have a copy of it in your package. I just want to... Uh, mention that to you, I spoke to our supervisor here in Braddock District and they put in their monthly newsletter, the December Food for Fines. Now I plan to talk about the other ones for their January newsletter. So that's what I, I would suggest. And uh, just wanna remind you that it's here. I always yank it out of the package and you know, stick it in a, an easy to get to spot. Other than that, outreach is meeting in February or sometime next year. <laughs> Priscilla. Hi, Brian. Thanks um, for pointing out the talking points. And maybe I'm the only one that would um, find it helpful. But I'm wondering if the outreach committee can consider having an, um, and maybe it, it exists and I just don't know where it is, but having an HTML version that has links of where I can send someone a link that can actually get them to information about some of these programs so that they can participate or that they can include it in things like school newsletters and things like that. So what I have, it's just written here. I know some of it is anticipating an event that hasn't happened yet. And I certainly don't wanna create more work for anyone, but I know that it would be, uh, I would be able to reach more people instead of just talking about it or sharing the short text here giving the information as it exists off of the, the library website. Yeah, I agree. It seems to me, and I, what you yeah. may have seen me looking for here and I have failed to find, is a copy of just that sheet uh, that came in to the account as a kind of a Word document. I always just forward it to myself because I can't save it otherwise and then take that and, and put it in my books app on iOS. And I thought there were links in it, uh, live links. So I don't know, Christine, I'll throw this to you. If you can, if you can send that document out with the links live, I don't think it has to be HTML, but uh, I think a PDF will work, but it just has to be done. Uh, I don't know. I thought I had seen one like that and I can't seem to find it right now. I think Aaron. Oh, Miriam. Did you want yes. No, I'm okay. sorry, members of the public cannot comment. I'm not, I'm the marketing director. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so and I wrote the talking points. Um, yes. So there, yeah. there absolutely exists a version with live links. It doesn't make any sense to just have the hard copy. I agree. Yeah. So we'll make yeah. sure that that gets out to you. All right. Um, Perfect. And no, it doesn't need to be HTML because it's all in there. So that's all done. We'll yeah. just make sure it gets to you. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Thank and thank you. Brent, so. Can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, Miriam. What's the um, the new tracking platform called Beanstack? What does it track, Christine? It's a um, it's a reading program. So, like for the summer reading program, the winter reading program, it's it tracks participation, and and it so it's a is, it's a program for your use for the administ for the library. Well, it's public facing. Okay. So you would sign up. You as a as a participant would sign up with Beanstack. 
and it's built for libraries. So it doesn't have all of the extra information that we don't want to collect. Okay. So it's built for reading programs for libraries. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Among other things, but that's, that's the main use for it. Cool. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any? No. Okay, great. Uh, the ad hoc policy committee, Sheila, policy committee, Sheila. Hi, we met yesterday and um, we did a couple of things. We reviewed and discussed the draft version of electronic meetings, not the meetings we're having now, which are on Zoom and they are the emergency um, online meetings that we're allowed to have uh, by order of our government, but this would be in the future. And so it's this is very much a draft and very much in discussion because um, we're talking about technology that we really don't know <laughs> <laughs> what, what will exist, what we have now. So it, it's, it's gonna be an interesting um, um, document when we do finish it. And then we also um, review policy W, which relates to um, using library grounds and parking lots. And I think that will be ready um, as a consideration item in our January meeting. And our next meeting will be January 12th um, on Zoom. So if anybody wants to, Tune in. We are meeting at one o'clock on, on January the 12th. Okay, thank you. And I think now we're ready for the director's report. Christine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna just talk about one Fairfax tonight, um, except for one thing, which is we are keeping a close eye on um, COVID and what's happening in um, other jurisdictions. Um, but as I emailed you earlier this week, we've really, in Fairfax County, we've tied ourselves to the recovery, the Virginia recovery phases. And one of the advantages to that is it gives the staff um, planning ability so that they can watch the governor, they can listen to what he's saying and give them kind of an idea of where we're going rather than every day wondering, oh, what's admin gonna do today? Are we gonna close today? Are we gonna close tomorrow? Are we gonna go back to curbside? So it's intended to give kind of a framework so, so that we're not having people guess about what our services will be. I think it's been successful, um, but we can certainly, you know, we will revisit it as the uh, conditions dictate. Um, so one fair facts, I'm delighted that Mary was able to join us. Her, her um, presentation was fabulous. Yeah. And I thought that it would be helpful, Jessica, and I thought it would be helpful to give you real life examples of what the library is doing for One Fairfax, because we've been um, considering equity in all of our um, decision-making and policy reviews since 2016. And I'm delighted to say that the director's leadership team, this has become kind of second nature to us now. So anytime something comes up for kind of um, normal review, like if we're buying new software or renewing a software subscription or just looking at a policy because it's been a couple of years, we use what's called an equity lens. And we, that's a series of questions that we ask that's, that are basic, but are really important. And it's, who is this um, policy serving? Is there anybody that it is not serving? If there is somebody that's not being served by it, is there any way we can mitigate that? And if we can't mitigate it, can we make sure that we're not misserving the same uh, group of people over and over again. So it's, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. It means we have to be thoughtful and deliberate and make sure that we are considering access and equity and um, fairness when we make these decisions. Um, and these decisions are wide and they're deep. Some of them are tiny and they have a very narrow focus. Um, and some of them are tiny and they have a really broad reach. And then some of them are super deep. And so anyway, it's, it's fascinating work. I think we've been really successful and I'm gonna toot our horn a little bit here and say that the One Fairfax folks hold the library up as um, an agency that's really embraced One Fairfax and they use us as an example a lot. And I'm really proud of that. So um, just for ease, I, cause I'm a nerd, surprise. I um, did a spreadsheet on all of the different One Fairfax or policy decisions that have an equity component to them that we have um, made over the last six, uh, four years, five years. And it's over 60 items. And again, some of them are tiny and some of them are significant. Some fell into our laps and some we went out looking for. Um, 
but I can't go through all 60 of them because you guys will go to sleep. So I broke them into some categories and the broad categories are access to our facilities and our materials, um, education, marginalized communities, and um, money, because those tend to be some of the main barriers that we have. Um, and I'll just give you a few examples if you want more, I'm happy to talk about it, but um, you know, I know you have other stuff to do in this meeting. So I just wanted to give you a couple of really meaty examples that would explain what we're really doing. As far as access goes, we eliminated program re registration. So that's a really big one. Uh, people don't know to, to register and then they'd come for a program and they wouldn't be welcome. And that's a disservice to everybody. Um, access services had a disability fair and this was revolutionary for us. It was extremely well attended and people from all over the DC Metro region came. Um, the world language bags, which the Fairfax uh, Library Foundation is supporting um, have been incredibly successful. We can't keep them on the shelves. Um, Laurel Takama, who is the branch manager at Thomas Jefferson, Mary's branch, um, had an initiative to do welcome videos in eight different languages, or maybe it's six different languages. They're fabulous. So if you're not from the United States, you don't know what a public library is, how are you going to know what we can offer you? They're dynamite. They're on our um, YouTube channel. So I encourage you to look at them. Shall I send out a link to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I will send a link. Um, and then this was a really weird one. Um, all of our facilities are ADA accessible as they need to be, but the restroom at the George Mason branch, um, mm -hmm. we had two different women in um, wheelchairs who were unable to open the doors. And it wasn't because the doors were too heavy. It was because they weren't wide enough for, to maneuver a wheelchair and open the door at the same time. And facilities management kept saying, no, no, they're accessible, they're accessible. And when it happened to the second person, I said, well, you're gonna have to explain why these poor women have to get stuck in our restroom and you know, be rescued by somebody else. And now we have accessibility push buttons. Um, so we didn't go looking for that one, but when we, when we became aware of it, um, we knew that it was an, um, an equity issue and we were on it. Education, we did Girls Who Code, we did a trade school career fair um, and career online high school, which is one of my favorites. Um, marginalized communities, meet your Muslim neighbor. Um, we've had that at a bunch of different branches to just encourage education and communication. We've had um, staff present about kaleidoscope story hours at Virginia Library Association and the kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope story hours are for um, children who uh, are on the autism spectrum. And those have been attended by people all over the DC metro area. We no longer collect gender for library um, card applications. And that one was a weird one too. Somebody from Alex or Arlington Public Library called us and said, hey, are you guys still collecting gender? And we said, yeah. And they said, well, why? And we looked at each other and said, I don't know. I think it's just a habit that we didn't think to rethink. Mm -hmm. And once we realized that it was information we didn't need, and we realized that it was from way back in the day where we used to send out correspondence that said, dear Mrs. Jones, blah, 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 about your library account. Well, now our correspondence says, dear Christine Jones, blah, 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 blah. So we don't need it and there's no reason to collect it and it made people uncomfortable. So it was a really easy decision to not collect it anymore. Mm -hmm. My very favorite of this one makes me cry. Um, we, we started um, allowing, we, we enabled, a feature on our integrated library system that allows people to uh, select a nickname because we are beholden to their legal names for account registration purposes. But their legal name, maybe not the name that they choose for a variety of reasons, but it's particularly um, difficult for um, people transitioning from one gender to another. And so um, we flipped a switch very easily I have received only three um, pieces of feedback about it, but they all made me cry because they were from either parents or people who are in the process of um, transitioning who said, this is the only place that I feel welcome and that my preferences feel validated. And 
I, that is just so touching. It's a, again, it's a pretty narrow slice, but it's a significant impact on that narrow community. Um, and then money, money's a pretty obvious one, but we've done food for fines. We've done read away your fines. We've uh, partnered with the schools for the LEAP accounts so that um, children can check out books no matter what their Fairfax County Public Library card status is. We've eliminated processing fees for damaged materials and eliminated replacement card fees. And then the big coup de grace was trying to eliminate fines on children's material and that went through until COVID snapped us and it got taken out of the budget. But we're gonna continue on with that um, because uh, as the literature, as you saw in the um, Atlantic uh, Journal um, article, um, that is what the literature is pointing us toward. So I have tons and tons of other examples, <laughs> but I wanted to give you kind of a wide understanding of that some of them are significant and took a long time, like the LEAP accounts and food for fines. Those were major projects. Yeah. Um, some of them were lickety split. Some are occurring only in the branches and some are system wide. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Fantastic examples. Uh, Keith. Yeah, Christine, are you able to share that spreadsheet list? Um, I'm, I'm probably a nerd like you and I'd love to do it. <laughs> I'd love to share it with you um, with the understanding that it's really, really rough and I would ask yeah. you not to publicize it, but for your own use, I'm happy to share it. All right, yeah, absolutely. And I, I understand that it was done for your internal purposes. So yeah. I understand. Thank absolutely, you. I'm happy to share it. Thank you, you for too. asking. Yeah. Anybody else? I would like one. Anybody else besides Keith? I think Sheila, Gary. Okay, I I'll send it everybody. out to the gang. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You don't have to open it if you don't want. <laughs> would you like, some of the things are equity related and some are not equity related. Do you want me to only send the equity related ones? Whatever's easy for you. If you don't, you don't have to fiddle okay. with it. I think, I mean, that's, that would be my first thought. Everybody else, is that okay? Just, yes. We're just interested in everything. So, sure. Yeah. I have a question, a may I? Uh, Brian? Yeah, it's just uh, that Atlantic article, of course, every time we talk about fine, something that comes to my attention. It was very interesting, and I had no idea that the large, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia. It's a huge free library system. I had no idea they'd done away with their fines, as have many big cities. So are we tied to the budget process for that? Because I know it's attached to some dinky amount of money. Well, dinky yeah. in regard to the entire budget. But so so if if we as a board at some point said, hey, you know, we really think we want to do away with fines altogether and this is how we're going to process, yada yada, uh, and came up with a plan, how would we present that to the supervisors? Would we have to eat that money? In other words, say, okay, I, you know. You have money in there for fines, but but we're not going to be taking it in, and so we, the library budget, is going to reduce by that amount, or or what? How would how would we do that? And are we working on it from the staff to them? There you go. Oh, heck, Minor question. yeah, we are working on it. That is our uh, yes, that is a focus, and we're being strategic about it because we are a general fund agency, and we are beholden to the budget. Um, and what we are trying to do is show that the amount of staff time and energy that we expend to bring in a relatively small amount of money and the negative community relationships that that, you know, that has a cost too. So we're being deliberate about it and we're trying to phase it in um, because we're following other, um, other agencies that have phased stuff in, similar to how we were doing the hours to phase it in. So yes, we are working on it. We are being very deliberate and strategic about it rather than just saying, hey, let's stop it right now. Cause we've got tons and tons of literature that talks about why it's important. So we feel like we can back it up but we just need to make it not hurt quite so much all in one fell swoop. Bill, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I have no issue at all with doing away with fines. My, my only concern is, you know, let's say we would start broadcasting that then, you know, I think we could be encouraging people not to return books. You know, I have no issue with us not charging fines, but I, I don't know that it would be something that we should broadcast because I think we could create 
a whole separate problem if we do that. Okay, thank I you, Phil. I think we'll, we're not gonna have a discussion on fines, but um, any other questions for um, Christine's presentation? Liz has a question. I, I don't even know if it's appropriate. I was just, <laughs> I was just wondering um, if the foundation could help us out with a transition um, uh, amount of money for covering the fines as a community service kind of, and I'm not sure what the foundation's charter is, but I was just wondering if that's a possibility and maybe that's something, you know, Miriam's on the finance uh, uh, of the committee here and also on the foundation now. I know uh, there are limitations what the foundation can do, but um, is that something as a service to the community that they could help out with it in terms of, well, it's not something fine. that we can say, uh, except that the, the foundation exists to enhance library services, uh, not to replace what the county should be, so that right. if the county were to, you know, make some sort of a decision about that, that would, you know, and it's not really, you know, this is sort of getting into the realm of discussing public policy, which we really shouldn't be doing. But Phil, one, if you have a different question, do you have a different question or do you have the same issue? It has to be different. <laughs> brief comment reference to what Liz said is if you can't do the foundation, possibly we could reach out to the friends group if we were looking for some support. I can't understand you. I said possibly we could reach out if we want to do this to the friends of the library group to add support for taking helping with the fines. Yeah. All right. Any other um, comments or questions on Christine's presentation? No? Okay, thank you. Christine, then that's it for you, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we're now moving on to the action items. And it is will be time for discussion then. Um, but I'm, I just want to uh, go through the process, um, especially for people who haven't been through it before. And for those of us who haven't been through it in a while, it's good to review. So we have three. The first one um, will be whether to rename. I, I know all of you have read the consideration items, but I'm just going to do a quick overview. So the first one will be the Rena the naming of a, a room in honor of Will Jasper. So that will be the first one. The second one is on the policy for renaming libraries and also the issue of spaces, uh, facilities and fixtures in the library. And then the third one is for updating the bylaws. And the process will be that, um... now, do we read the whole thing, Christine? We don't have to read the whole, Thing. No, because you have it. It's in the packet. Um, and then there would then I will ask for a motion, uh, and then a second, and then a vote on the motion, and then there'll be discussion. So the first one is really straightforward. The second one, when we get into rewriting, in which people may want to talk about specific sentences, then we will have a little bit different process, and I'll describe that when we get to it. So the first one, the action item is the naming of a conference room for Will Jasper at the John Marshall Library. I move, so, move that one. Pardon I me? Move. I move that we approve that. Please, if you just wait for me to make sure that I call on you. But so oh. Phil has made the motion and a second from Brian. And all those in favor of the motion, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, great. Any discussion? No, you would do the discussion before you vote, I think. Yes. You're right. That was out of out of the yes, you're right. But if, if people don't want to discuss it, then we could actually be happy we voted to approve yeah. and move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any discussion <laughs> before we vote again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, great. So um let's vote on the motion to accept this. No, you already did. You already so, did that. But now really yeah. after I asked in the discussion. future. James. See how efficient you are? Okay, so this has passed. Yes. <laughs> well done. Another pile. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the net, we're not ready for the bylaw. Yeah, here we go. We got the policy P regarding the naming of libraries and spaces and fixtures. So Sheila. Okay. 
Okay, so. She will explain the changes. Okay, so what we did was we, um, since we have the authority, we learned we had the authority to name and rename libraries. Um, we changed wordings, we condensed sentences and in, in bullets to uh, make it more readable. So here in the first one, the library board has the authority to name and rename a library in, cons in con consolation with appropriate county entities or the board of supervisors. And then all new libraries shall be named for a geographical area in which they are located. And then we made number two, the library- Wait, so just, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry can, I, can I name? Can I just interrupt for one second here? Sure? So yes, just to distinguish between the new and the old, the old, li the old policy already established that any new libraries should be named for the geographic areas right. in which they're located. The purpose of these changes here that Sheila just mentioned is that if, if any library, existing library is renamed, it would also be renamed for geographical area. So just to be clear about what is already in place. Thank you. Fran, does the discussion? Not yet, we haven't started the discussion yet. So, so, oh, so we go through the whole thing, okay. So then the second one, we've condensed it. So the second one is the library board may consider the remaining of a, renaming of a library if a request comes from, and I can't see the rest of it. Um, oh shoot, it's- um, And reflects the wishes. The wishes of a citizen within the library service area. And if it benefits, oops, I'm gonna have to, I can't, my, my thing is there, the, um, the name change will outweigh the cost such a name change can generate. So that is a request coming from citizens. Um, Number three, the library board may consider naming a library area, such as a meeting room or installing a plaque for a corporation, group, or an individual, living or deceased, who has made a significant contribution to the Fairfax County Public Library System or to an individual library. So that makes it a very um, personal from our, our existing um, citizens. Um, then we got rid of four in number five. Um, I think that you can just read that there was no changes there. Six, we changed a couple of words. I wanna say that we spent a lot of time with the language, trying to make it up to date and clear. So um, you'll see that we changed words like shall and will and may, not in this one, but this is just, we'll go forward into the next, the bylaws, but um, Okay, so now there's a discussion. No, now um, okay. you would uh, make a, a main motion to accept policy P as changed. Okay, so I make a motion that we accept policy P changes as they as we have made them. Policy P, uh, yeah. yeah. Do I have and a second? I'll second? Do we not get to? We, one not, we have a second. Sure. Now we have, we have a second. Thank you for a second. Now we have discussion. Uh, and be, uh, let's have to get gallery view back, which I can't when I'm on share screen share. So That's Jane, good. do you have gallery view to see everybody? Uh, I, it's I, I, I don't. want to speak. Well, the screen, I, I need the gallery view to see who would like to speak. Yeah, I don't have it either. Everyone, it's too I'd big. I'd like to speak, uh, ask a question. I think Liz did also. Yes. <laughs> so everybody, if um, whoever is sharing their screen right now, if you could take that down, because okay, we all great. have this. All right, now we can see. So. All right, so okay. we have Liz Sujatha. Who else would like to There's speak? Phil. Phil? Okay. So I think Sujatha okay. might've been the first one I saw. So okay. Sujatha? Um, did you wanna go, uh, I just had a couple of comments, but did you wanna do it like number by number to be clear? Yeah. Okay. So on number, the new number two, I wanted to know, because I don't know what the history of this is, when it says here, and if the benefits of the name change outweigh the costs, what constitutes benefit of the name change outweighs the cost? Is that actually, are you talking about like uh, emotional cost to the community? Are you, what are you talking about? You're we're talking, talking, about, we're talking the, about the actual cost, um, a flat cost money. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a statue, not a statue, but if there's, um, you know, a, an object. So yeah. the issue then is the benefits more than the cost. So it's like you're, the cost is, is um, 
um, justified by the benefit it would be to the community. Exactly. You have done that. Right. Okay. So think about it this way. The benefits are always going to be subjective in this case. Right. And the costs are objective. Right, right, right. And they're, I mean, and, and this is a, this is permissive, not required, mm -hmm. because the whole concept is subjective. Who's okay. to say that if it costs a hundred thousand dollars to change all the paperwork. I mean, changing a website now is not that expensive, yeah, yeah. but there is at a certain point, depending on what the library's budget is, et cetera, et cetera, that it might be that that objective criteria would trump the subjective. But so, this is just so what this does is it allows the library board to make that subjective decision Understood. without making it too strict one way or the other. Thank you. Okay, Liz, I think you were next. I had three, and uh, one of them was not quite what Sujatha had about number two, but close to it. Um, and I understand sometimes it's good to have very, very um, uh, liberal, generic kind of words, and sometimes it's better to define it. But are we setting ourselves up on number two that says, reflects the wishes of citizens within the library service area, where we don't say, it, you know, I, again, it might be the easiest way to say it as generic as that, but we could be challenged, I think, as a board, this, if 10 people came forward and said that they had concerns about uh, a certain uh, 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 item in the library, what if, what uh, or the name, um, how, what is sufficient volume for, of citizens complaint or interest in changing the name? It's very loosely worded here and I'm wondering if it needs to be tightened up or if we're keeping it very generic on purpose but does that not open us up to uh, uh, not listening to a small minority group of citizens so so Sheila maybe I'll just take a shot at this to Why don't start. You take a shot at it yes. yeah so we did discuss this a lot and and discussed exactly what you raised uh, which is should we have some kind of numeric, criteria, that it had to be at least 10 people, that you had to get a petition, that, and all of that seemed to be too strict and difficult to, um, um, you know, to control. And so that's why it is vaguer, but it's also, we also have a may in there. And so in the very beginning, it says library board may consider the renaming, which means that it is again, going to be a subjective a you know, decision if if a so it could be just one person comes forward and says I don't like the fact that library X is still named for a historical figure um, and if that happens then we'd have to go through some type of process to to review that complaint but given that it's within the library board's discretion to consider you know that the volume of complaints versus the costs that would be a decision we would make. And that's kind of the purpose of the board. Another okay. And another aspect of that was um, the idea of the service area. Like what we were, you know, we right. worked on that in terms of um, people who lived, you know, within a certain radius of the library or could, you know, people use all libraries all over the county. So the service area would have to be you know, we couldn't really do that big de little definition. Sheila, I mean, the other option just to, from the committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Sheila, I wonder if you want to add anything from the committee discussion. Well, no, well let me, the, the one other point for is that we also consider just taking this out entirely, right? Yeah. Just not even having it. But we, then we felt like, look, this has been an option in the policy this whole time. Mm -hmm. It seems, that seems counter to transparency to the public if we don't have something, if we don't say something about the fact that we would be, you know, we care yeah. about if, if a yeah. citizen comes from. I'm, I'm personally comfortable with the May and, the, and it, it's a judgment at that time of who's out on the library, whether that citizen group, uh, their interest warrants, um, you know, something to be done. So I'm, I'm fine, we, you know, we need to uh, be responsible for the decisions that we make, but I just wondered, yeah, I know from a legal perspective, sometimes it's good to be very specific and other times it's better to uh, leave it very generic and, and I'm comfortable with that personally. Um, the first one, uh, the first point on number one though, I am wondering when we leave it so vague, where it says in consultation with appropriate county entities or the board of supervisors. I'm just wondering if we shouldn't be more specific to say that the 
the district supervisor where that library is uh, uh, going to be or renamed uh, needs to approve it rather than appropriate county entities um, or the board of supervisors, that's all of the board. Uh, but that's to me is again, leaving a little bit to, if I, if I was responsible to implement this, I would not really know what I was responsible to do. In other words, well, the research that we did was that, you know, the libraries are not owned by the library department. They're owned by the facilities department. So, um, and Jessica did the research that, you know, we do have the authority to rename them, but we do need to do it in consultation. And I think rather than cite a specific agency, you want to keep it like that in case the agency name changes or something. Sheila, is there anything? No, that's exactly, we kept it broadly for that reason, because um, things change. And so rather than listing agency names that may change or have different functions that name by name, we would have a wide range of, of um, supervisors or entities to consult and not be tied down to something that we would, that's not listed here. So we, we did deliberately go with the broad um, umbrella. So Sheila, are you saying here that it's a, really an or that if we consulted with, we'll say right now facilities um, and they approved our, an or. we wouldn't have to go any further. No, it is an or, it is an or. It would be case by case. So we were leaving it broad to see, you know, we don't know what's going to come up. So we've left it broad so we can um, have options. It may be a particular, you know, one supervisor or it might be appropriate for the whole board to, um, to be brought into it or a county entity. So we left it broad with an or deliberately. Well, how would that decision be made real time? Uh, how do you know? It would be made in time. You know, we would we would weigh what what facts we had at the time. Whether you needed to go to the board of supervisors, or you need to just go to the district supervisor, or or even even go to the board of supervisors. Well, I think that we would know when the. Um, when the, you know, when the request was made, what avenue we would take, you know, we wouldn't. Yeah, I think the library director yeah. will be in on that, you know, she, right. the, who person is the library director will be on top of that. And it may be a little different at another time. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the way the whole process of a new library, you know, does that. I don't know. Geographic just... area. I hear Miriam, do you want to add anything or Christine? No, thank you. Covered it. That would you? Oh, okay. I, I think um, Brian, Phil sorry. was next. <laughs> I think Phil was next in the, on the queue. Well, the questions. last thing, I had one more thing. Oh, I had three things. And that was number two. The, if you go down to number four, I know it's something that's been in there for a while. I just don't understand how it relates to naming when it says after the last sentence under now number five, excuse me, uh, up here, it's number five. After a period of 10 years from the donation of a fixture or a piece of furniture, the library may continue to fund the maintenance of the fixture or furniture at its discretion. Mm -hmm. How does that play into naming anything? Well, the, the policy, it used to be two different policies and that was under the other one. And now we've combined them because they're related to each other. Right. But, but, so but is that your question, not number about five, the budgetary? Because it should be, we, 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 we missed a numbering. So if this always happens, you read it a million times. <laughs> paragraph five should be Two. four, paragraph oh, six right. should be five. Yeah, that should be four. So, four and they're five, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would never I would never look under a naming policy for that kind of information. Not that I would be looking well the whole look at the title of the policy regarding the name of, of libraries, spaces, and fixtures. Right. You know, to, to me it was naming of spaces and naming of fixtures. And that does apply to naming of fixtures, the first part of it, but the other part about retiring something after 10 years and not providing maintenance, it, to me it just had nothing to do with it. That's yeah. all. I, I can oh, give it you, does. I can give you an example. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Liz, I can give you an example. If there was a bench, for example, and one library does have a bench, um, after 10 years, the library would then have the option to say, well, you know, it's falling apart. It's not worth 
I understand that anymore. Yeah. But I was looking at this whole thing as being naming because it starts out by saying the library board may also consider naming a library fixture or piece of furniture. That I understood. That applies to this policy. But all of a sudden, as a new person on the board, we throw in about, well, maybe after 10 years, we might not maintain that piece of fixture in the first place. And I'm going like, how does a 10 year in maintenance have anything to do with the naming of that fixture? That's all. Okay. Are you good with it now? Well, I can, I can, if you guys are good. You can get it. Okay, I, Phil, I think you had a question. I have significant concern on the number two followed up on Liz is because it's really hard to understand you for your microphone. I don't know. I, number I, two of what? I have the same uh, concerns, let's say, that Liz had when she brought it, but more so today, you know. I initially thought, let's put a number on it or something. But today, it's very, very easy, you know, for a group to get together and send email out to a bunch of their friends or, you know, take a particular uh, uh, citizen's association and get the number of names if we had a number. And, and the second thing with this is possibly there would be a way to, to put a dollar amount in there, you know, where it would be considered if the cost would be less than and I'm going to use a number 10,000. It doesn't matter what the number is, but somewhere I, I could just see somebody getting, you know, I don't particularly like this name. And so now I want to change it. And then if it comes to us, we could be sitting here all day long doing nothing but looking at suggested name changes to all the libraries. So I'm very concerned with that by the way it's written. Then the next part is number five and the word uh, significant contribution uh, concerns me. Uh, if there's any lawyers on there, you know, that, that's just something that in any, uh, could, could lead to a good lawsuit. But let me use a stupid example. Suppose I gave two books to the uh, George Mason Library and I think it's a significant contribution. So I want you to change the name of the library to my name. So, you know, when we put Not things like happen. that in this, it, it's hard. <laughs> It's hard to, uh, you, you know, what's a significant contribution is, is the comment there. So I don't like the wording. So um, for number five, Phil, we're talking about a library fixture or a piece of furniture, not a whole branch building. So that would be a little bit different than you know, the, your contribution, me, and I think when we talked about contributions, the understanding was that it would be somebody who been volunteering for a number of years or had been doing some sort of a volunteer programming or, or volunteering, you know, one of the, one of the pick, the pick list volunteers, you know, something that they've done to the library, not, not, a, not a financial contribution. Well, I hear you, but and it would be, and it would be a lot. None, of, none of what you said is defined there. In my, you know, I I understand what you're trying to do here, and I agree with it. But the significant contribution leaves it pretty open. You know, you you went on and gave a number of reasons. You know, yeah. some of the volunteers, like the friends group, had been there for thirty years or something. You know, and you so know would you feel more comfortable if we we gave some examples of what the contribution would be? Well, I would feel more comfortable to, to spell that out a little bit or try to come up with a different word. <laughs> okay. Well, re just remember also oh. this, this has been in this policy for like forever. Yeah. So I, we're looking at the whole policy now to revise certain parts of it, but this particular paragraph as written has existed yeah. for, I mean, well before all of our tenure on the board. And I know when Gary did his review of policies, they looked at it. So just historically, this has not been an issue that somebody has come in and said, Mr. John Doe has, I believe, made a significant contribution. Please name the water fountain after him. And there's been some kind of big controversy. Yeah. It's also, you know, the library board also again can say no. I mean, that's it's right. That's right. Written so that it is exactly. something that we would consider and then vote. 
and just and i think we and i think we have a good example um with the will jasper situation yeah. where the contribution that he made um to yeah. the library board you know was that and right. i'm sorry liz but on a on a discussion according to robert's rules you just get to talk once uh, I want to on Phil's, but so do we have a i can't tell who's next jane did you can you Without the gallery view, I can't tell. There we go. Oh, okay. So Gary, did you have, yeah, you're on the committee, yeah. so go ahead, Gary. Oh, I, I just wanted to make a general comment that the reason we have a board is to make specific decisions about specific items at a specific time, because it's impossible ahead of time to write a rule that would cover all situations right as we look as we review all these changes uh, i would suggest that we keep that in mind yeah thank you okay, great thank you gary and i think suzanne yeah i just wanted to point out in regards to naming the libraries and people were concerned about the number of people, but there's a countywide initiative right now to look at names in the county. And so we have to be ready for that if any of our branch libraries um, come under scrutiny in this county initiative. And I kind of expect that some of them will. Um, so I, I th I'm in favor of all these changes. I think they make perfect sense to me. And again, like Gary said, it's the board's job to determine if it's significant enough or not. And we're not going to be renaming any libraries except for locations, no more people, which should solve a lot of issues in the future, I think. Okay. So Liz, did you have a question? No, I was just going to comment on Phil about the significance, the same thing that Gary uh, really basically said is that it gives the board the flexibility to how are they going to apply that term significant. And we don't want to necessarily box ourselves in with very specifics on that kind of a thing. Right. So any other discussion on the main men, the main menu, the main, um, the main motion, which is to accept the, the new policy as it's written. Any other discussion? Suzanne? I the question. Okay, so the question has been called. So all in favor, please signify, raise hand, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, say no. Okay, that has passed. Good job. Okay. The next one is the bylaws. And um, I would like to turn that over to, to Sheila. Um, I was out this afternoon and there was an issue with of which was the correct version that had been distributed to people. So oh um, or, or Christine or someone on the committee who can steer Gary, people to the right thing. Gary recognized that, that in the December packet we had in, accidentally put an old version. The November packet, if you have your November packet, has the correct version. And I have the correct version here that I'm happy to share when that, if and when that becomes helpful. And I emailed you guys all the correct version, uh, maybe about, about five o'clock this afternoon. Oh, so. So how many, did everybody have a chance to see the correct version? It was in the November packet. It should have been the one you reviewed. Right. Okay. Could quick. you bring the correct version up on your screen or do you want to go through the changes first? I, I have the correct version. You sent yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I printed out the correct one. I'm looking at it right, right here. before the meeting. Uh, uh, Gary. I, I was just going to say that the, the correct version is in the December packet in its entirety, but what isn't there are the specific changes yeah. good so if if you only have the, the, your packet and, and you look at uh, the recommended updated that that is correct oh okay so it's can you see this it's this is the correct one oh, i've got it and it has it has red i'm looking at the december packet and it has a version with the changes. Yes. Yeah. It's that, not that's all the changes. Wrong. Ah. Oh, got November it. Number is good, right? 
So Jane, if you tell me when I can put the, when I can share the screen and I'm not blocking your view of who is, you know, wants to speak, I've, I'm happy to do that. And I'm sorry for so the First, should we do the, um, the motion in order to have the discussion? Yep, get it, get it on the floor and then we can yeah, um, okay. so, show on your screen, Christine, the language. So would one of the members of the committee like to make that motion? I so move. <laughs> Okay, a uh, second? I'll second. Okay, and now discussion. Got that right. <laughs> so we will look at it. But I won't, but we won't know who's next. <laughs> so I could I suggest that Christine show the bylaws and Sheila or a committee member walk us through the bylaws. Write the changes. And then Fran, if you could pause and say, okay who would who has a question or a comment and christine just quick turn that off so we've got gallery view so we can get the names great okay so jane you're saying that we will discuss one at a time we were, we're going to we're go talking. through the changes because we have once again we have a main motion to accept all the changes so we'll go through all the changes then if somebody has a change that they really want to rewrite that would require a secondary motion we don't okay. want to so do that. Sheila do you want to go through the red line for yes. everybody so, yes let's get it up on the screen yeah okay I'm sorry I have too many windows open give me just a second sorry about this okay. right mm -hmm. feel you <laughs> and I, I just want to tell everyone I think the changes in the bylaws are um are small changes and I think they all serve to make them more effective more efficient more specific and more uh, you know, th they're kind of picky, tiny. Right. They're not big global things. And they re and they relate to things like when somebody's um, time starts on the board. So, um, yeah. Or if there was a not a superscript in the text. Script. I mean, it's right. really. <laughs> yeah. That's really you know just just a typo type of thing. So the first real change. Let's see. Goes. Keep scrolling. Okay, so here, the first change is when the chair and vice chair shall assume their official duties on July 1st. So that, that's the change. We took out the- um, so If you could book. say the article and the section. Oh, well, okay. So you can find. Let me just. This is article five under elections. And it's, num it's letter D, here we go. So the change was to be specific and, and to give the date. So the, vice, the chair and the vice chair shall assume their official duties on July 1st. And then in section two, change the superscript. So that's, that's a typo. And I think, um, sorry to interrupt you, but I think that um, Gary, isn't this where you, you, that ink doesn't belong there? The Fairfax County Public Library Foundation, I don't think it has an ink incorporated. Do you, what do you, yeah. Christine? Do you know? Yes, it does or no? No, it should not, okay. Yeah, so can right. we cross that out now? Okay, all right, I'm sorry to interrupt, but while we're there, might as well do it. Okay, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, then in section three, again, we were being specific. We took out a lot of the um, vague language. And so we collapsed A and B into A. Each year at the April meeting, the chair shall appoint a nominating committee of two board members whose responsibility shall be to establish a slate of officers, including chair, vice chair, and foundation director. And that particular foundation director we haven't elect we haven't elected that position before um, it was appointed by um, the chair so it's supposed to be a foundation director is supposed to be elected at this time so that has changed and um, and the nominations at the regular May meeting am I missing something and to report the results of the nominations at the regular May meeting neither the chair nor the vice chair shall be eligible for this assignment 
B, any trustee may submit their name or the name of another trustee to the nominating committee by two weeks before the regular May meeting. C, only those persons who have signified their consent to serve, if elected, shall be nominated for election. Nomination shall be announced at the May meeting of the board. And then E is additional, no, it's D, additional and nominations may be made at the May or J meetings from the floor. So, so just to be specific, D was the nomination shall be announced at the May meeting board. And e, e, yeah. right. And it's e just a little bit of a additional. typo. The red line is typo. And E is, is yeah. So basically yeah. this is what we've been doing, but we've been clear about the, um, the time frame, and we've added foundation director to the election process. And then in section four, the elections, each year at the June meeting, election shall be held for the offices for the full following year. If a quorum is not present, a special meeting shall be called as soon as possible for the, pos for the purpose of holding elections. In the event of a vacancy in the office of chair, the vice chair shall serve for the remainder of the term. In the event of a vacancy in the office of a vice chair, it shall be, it shall be filled for the unexpired by a term by a person elected by the majority vote of the remaining members of the board, five days notice of such, elect, of such election being given. In the event, E, in the event of a vacancy of the office of the foundation director. And that should be director. Oh, yes, direction. direction, director, yes. Notice shall be given and the election held to fill such a vacancy. May I? Speak? Let's go. Can we go through all of them first? Oh, oh, okay. I thought we were talking about each one. Fine. No, we're gonna at the end. I'm sorry, I interrupted on that one because that's one we we did at the meeting and it didn't make it. My prerogative at the committee meeting. Oh, that that error. Correct. Okay. I'm okay. Sorry. An article on Article Six: Duties of the office officers. The only thing we changed here was serve on the Fairfax County Public Library Foundation Board of Directors. So it lists all the direct, it, it lists all of the, um, the duties of the, of the chair. And then section three, secretary of the board shall send notification of each regular meeting in hard copy and electronically to each board member no less than five days in advance to the date of the meeting. And then, and so basically um, we added the electronically and then going down to D, maintain minutes of all meetings online, period. Is there anything else beyond, beside, beyond that? Well, that used to be, they'll be in the branches. For right. People, branches, so we right. just so changed just that online. to electronically. Right. Yeah. And then E, index and codify all current policies of the board Copies shall be kept online, available for public Same, same thing with that, yeah. Same thing, right. Right. And then F, presence monthly statistical reports on library activities, financial reports and other reports as requested by the chair of the board. And then we just added a serve as a, a director of the Fairfax County Public Library Foundation. And then another ink there. Oh, there's yeah. another ink, yeah. Barry yeah. is our, our keeps us honest. Okay, in, in um, Article 7 meetings, regular meetings of the board shall be held once a month except August, and the time and day shall be determined by the chair in coordination with the secretary. And B. Um, going down to see actually regular or special meetings shall be held at a public location within the county or the city of Fairfax or fully virtually in a declared emergency, which we're in now. And then Article 8 committees, um, we fixed, a, we, we changed the committees to a, a small c, added a shell on B, and then we, we're basically cleaning up the language here. In Article 9, Parla Parliamentary Authority, Robert's Rules of Order newly revised. We, we changed 
to this particular edition to current edition to um, take in any kind of updates. And what, which, which one is this that you went to? The amendment of bylaws. See, again, we took out the shells and we just added S's. So we were just cleaning up the language here. And we haven't approved this yet. So to, to be announced, to be decided. I have a, okay, I have a discussion. Okay, uh, Brian and then Suzanne. Okay, uh, it's, it's kind of minor, but I think we need to, can you hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we've always treated, I, I thought ever since I've been on the board, the library foundation person, appointee, electee, whatever we call it, as a committee on our agendas and everything else. The committees are named by the new chair and vice chair of the board after June, because June is when they're elected. So they take office July 1st, then everybody is named. Under the new uh, guidelines here, we would elect in June the foundation director. And that's fine if we have to elect one, we should elect them at the election. But then they really can't be a committee chair and uh, it will tie the hands of hmm. the new chair of this board because that person, for example, she came, you came to me and asked me for outreach this year. Suppose I had been elected foundation director in June and you couldn't do that. It, it just seems a little bit odd to do it in two separate months and not make the foundation director still can be elected, but in July during the selection of the committee chairs. That's my thought. I, I don't care. I'll live with whatever you want. And then when you we do the agenda, the agenda isn't just committee chairs. It's the foundation director and the committee chairs. That's my thought. I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm asking, uh, what I'm saying is that you're treating the foundation director as an elected officer of this board. And that's fine if they're supposed to be elected, they should be elected. They're not really an officer of this board. They're a representative of the board. But you're doing it in June and then the new chair for example, this year, you were a new chair. You took over this year and you named your committee representative or representatives to the foundation, but but I don't know. We're, we just always treated the foundation director as a committee chair and a choice of the new chair of this board, not as an officer of the board. And it just seemed to me a little bit- I, Okay, I see your question. To elect them in June, and then tie your hands, for example, to say, you know, so we elect Suzanne and then you want to name her as the chair of a committee, but you can't because she's foundation director and really shouldn't have two things. Why not? So it, you could have two well, things. Well, she could. All right, she could, I guess. But yeah. it just seemed odd to do it in June well, as opposed to well, July after the new board is in place. So my thought. So Miriam, go ahead. For some, I don't know why, but the bylaws were always that the that the liaison or what we're calling the foundation director was an elected position. But honestly, that right. only exists like that because it was in the old set of bylaws yeah. and has been there for all these years. If somebody wants to, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think anybody's gonna, you know, gonna go out and burst a flame on this issue. But <laughs> if we just want to make it that the liaison to the foundation is also an appointed position by the chair that would simplify things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you would just do it all. I, I, I just, it's just not that big a deal yeah. one way or another. Yeah, right. yeah I, I see that too. And I, I think also when you were talking like calling it a committee, cause I know I had, ta I had talked over, I think with Suzanne and maybe Jessica or somebody else, I said, should we have someone else in case Suzanne can't go? And that seems sort of like overkill um, in terms of um, representative on the foundation, so yeah, we could have a we could ha entertain a motion uh, and then discuss whether to um, change the 
represented to the foundation from an elected position to an appointed position. So that that would have if if people if someone wants to do that, that would have to be a sec one of those secondary motions. And I, I'm happy to not, do that because I'm I actually not, think it makes more sense. I know that's okay. not what you're asking, Brian, but I no, would move no. that we make it an appointed position. And and while we're on this, the one of I don't know if this was part of your issue, Brian, but but for me, when I was elected in June, and then and I had to take over the meeting, and then all hell broke loose, and I hadn't been chair, I wasn't really familiar, and I thought that's crazy. It should be election in June, and the current chair continues until the end of that meeting, and with the new fiscal year in July, the chair begins responsibilities. Yeah. That's I, a little separate from what you were asking, I think. No, I, I agree. That's my point, is that's very good. Yeah. That's I think that's very good. It just seems to me that it ties the new chair's hands to have elected in June this representative. However, I, I, I don't care whether they're elected or not. It's fine to elect them. And if they choose to run two committees, that would be fine too. I didn't, you know, Miriam, I didn't realize you'd really do that. Everybody is supposed to be on a committee. And so it's kind of nice to-, to I mean, I don't need to make it a motion. I, it's just like, I'm I don't I'm fine know. with I, it the I way it is, care. as long as we <laughs> understand what- I just don't care about. So. As long as we're understanding what we're doing, we're, we're having someone elected to that position mm -hmm. and then the new chair takes over in July and they are given that representative. There's nothing that can be done about it, theoretically. Unless well, there, well, but that's the way it would be because it's supposed to be, <laughs> fine. In, well, unless we change, I mean, I don't see the- no, It's fine with me, it's fine with me. I just was bringing it up because it just okay. seems a little bit backwards and awkward for chairs such as yourself so, taking um, over. Suzanne, what do you have a comment on? Um, I, it seems to me to make perfect sense that it be an appointed position rather than an elected position. And if the wording can change to indicate that. Also throughout this, the Fairfax, it, the official name of the foundation is the Fairfax Library Foundation. All right, I, have, I made a note that, that we need to make that universal change. So yeah. wherever it appears in here, it needs to be corrected. Right, Fairfax right. Library foundation. So, so I think we have two, at least two secondary um, motions. So we need, uh, unless someone has a general, did, Priscilla, did you have your hand up? Okay. So does, so someone- uh, um, I believe Phil, to, has, Phil has his hand up. I was just gonna say, I second both of those if you wanna say. We haven't gotten them yet. <laughs> <laughs> so someone, I'll someone needs to make a motion uh, to change- Liz has her hand up. I was, I was just going to make the motion to appoint the foundation director um, uh, rather than make it an elected a position. And the reason behind that from my perspective is that when Suzanne- well, Let's just make the motion and, and then we'll do if there's discussion. Okay, so we have a motion and we have, a, well, let's have a second right now. Okay, Phil seconded it. <laughs> And now discussion. Yeah, I would just like to say, Suzanne, when she said earlier this evening that being on the foundation as our representative on that foundation, she did not have a vote. That tells me again, it doesn't need to be an elected position on our board, but as an appointed position. And I think it would make it much cleaner in terms of going forward. I, I don't know whether Fran, your position as the chair and um, Jessica or Christine's uh, acting position on the foundation is also a non-voting uh, person on the foundation, but that surprised me greatly that when Suzanne said that. So I don't know if you guys are normally a voting member or not, but um, I think the appointed position is, is an easier uh, thing to handle and to administer and um, appointment is the way to go. Okay, any other discussion? I, I would just say I, to clarify for Liz that, that Jessica is a sitting di voting director of the foundation board. I was the chair of that board. I thought she did a chair. The, the uh, chair of this board, huh? I think we always kind of treated that person as a voting director. Unfortunately, what happened is 
uh, that person was often a director, such as Miriam yeah. is now. She's actually a director on the board, and uh, her, you know, your predecessor was also a director on the board for many years. So, so I'm not absolutely sure if Fran, for example, gets a vote at one of their meetings. Well, would, I'm already would a not be bad to ask. You're all, that's right. You're already. I already was a director. Miriam was yeah. our director. Mir Miriam was our chair, and she wasn't yeah, a right. director until on the foundation until after that. So Miriam. Huh. What was your position on that on that foundation as our chair? Did, were you able to vote, or were they? Uh, able to vote? I think vote? I was able to vote, right? Yes, I, as I was saying, that we always treated the the board uh, chair, the, the library board chair, as a voting director, just like the library director okay. is a voting director. The individual who represented the board on there, Will Jasper, in my case, for the whole time I was there really wasn't a voting director. On the other hand, we always listened to what he said. So it, it really didn't matter is the point. But but I see your point that it, it's probably better as an appointed position, which is what we always we used it it as. Nobody nobody even realized we had the light. Right, that's why when I year. did it. It seems, it seems kind of stilted to do that. So I would agree that that making this person a uh, an appointee of the new chair starting one July makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So okay, any other discussion on the motion at hand, the secondary motion? Okay, so I'd like to call for a vote on the secondary motion with the language. I guess you read the language again, Christine. There was not specific language. Um, it was just suggested that the uh, with the motion, I thought she did in her motion. She said that she suggested that the position be appointed instead of instead of elected, but it was not a full sentence. <laughs> May I make a continuation of the discussion? Clearly, if, if we approve this, this, then the approval of the overall bylaws, which is your, your su super motion, I guess, mm -hmm. has to be approved with language to changed to make this happen. And that's mm -hmm. where Christine and others would have to just change the language. We'll just have to trust that you do it, which means taking out the election of that person, moving them into the committee and stuff. That's all done administratively, in my view, if and when that motion is approved and the bylaws then are approved with that change, okay? So, so Brian, to your point, if, if I did that, it would read yes. like this. Each year, so, the board chair shall appoint a member to serve as a director to the Fairfax County or Fairfax Library Foundation. Yep. And you would remove it from the election part in June. And we'd remove uh, it all that business about the foundation director that we had on those two other, I can't remember what there's, sections they are. There's a section, five three, there's a section yeah. two that's foundation representative. Yeah. Right. Article so, four. Well, it's also in article nominate five. in the nominations. It's also in yeah. there. So you can oh, take it Moved. Do I need to do I need to put in a motion again to say that no um, no I think we're good no it just has to we either have to if we approve this then we have to approve the overall motion oh, as changed right all. right uh, Gary I think we have an obligation to uh, vote on the specific language okay as stated uh, by Christine. So the, well, on all the places, and so it is in, first, um, she will walk us through where it first appears. I Let me see here, um, membership. Section three nominations, part A. So article five, section three, nominations A. Oh my gosh, oh, here we are, okay. So it yeah. just needs so to take be out the, from there, right? Bring it up to chair and take out and foundation director. Okay. Mm -hmm. The entirety of section two can be taken out, right? Well, can't you just change the the, the chairman shall appoint a member to serve? Yeah, but not under the elections. This is elections section, Article 5, Section 2 can be gone, done away with. Yeah, it's you're right. Elected right. Position. So the entirety of Section 2. And then under Article Although, 
Although but, Brian, where but where where yeah, else does yeah. it say that the uh, that the chair appoints the director? Oh, that that comes later. That it wouldn't come under. Yeah, where, yeah. Well, that's it comes under committees. Yeah. Under later on when you talk about it. see, yeah. right or not? Yeah, moves new moves. Well, if it's one person, two. is it really a committee? Well. <laughs> Um, you know what? I think maybe I the committee. Yeah. <laughs> I I would like us to make. I think we're getting into the weeds enough that the bylaws need to go back to committee. I agree. Agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree too. Let's do that. Yes. Okay. I move. I, I don't. First we, can the chair move. First, that we have to vote one of, you, on the, one of you committee members should move that. Okay. But first, Mary we or, have to change. May I? May I? Say, first, we have to vote. Oh, we on have a motion change. on the floor. You're right. There's a motion right. on the floor. We have to vote on that. If that goes through, then the other motion make makes sense, which would mean they just pulled the motion that they made. Okay. See what I'm saying? So let's vote on the secondary motion of um, changing the foundation, the representative from the library board to the uh, directors from elected to appointed. Hi. So ready to vote on that motion. Mm -hmm. All in favor of accepting Aye. that? Aye. Yes. Aye. Okay, great. Right. Um, and now, um, I May guess I... we need to go back to the main motion, the main motion that is still on the floor of accepting the, um, the bylaws as rewritten. And we're in the discussion phase, um, Gary. The main motion can be, can be rescinded by the persons who made it in the secondary. But, but Gary- In which case, then you would, Fran, would say that, that the bylaws will are going back to committee and will come up probably next month and okay. we'll vote on them again. Okay, I wanna hear yes. Gary, what Gary has to say. He's a member of the committee. Yes. Oh, I was just gonna say, could we finish going through it to see if there's any other guidance that the committee should have um, when we revisit it? Are there any other issues that, that we- well, let's see what time it is and how much do people want to do. It's five after nine, and I wonder if um, it would it might be well in the interest of time. Do people want to spend more time? Because um, I think it might be better if it can go if it goes back to committee. Look at those changes and then anything else. I, I want to get my committee members, uh, Sheila, the chair. Right, I think, um, I would think that it needs to go back to the committee to go to change what has been the motion that has changed those that wording. And um, we haven't heard any other. Uh, well, correcting the library foundation and that's something. Right, the, the, yeah. the library foundation is, is what we're mm -hmm. working on right yeah. now. Yeah. And, yes. and, and since you're in discussion for the main motion right. and we've agreed kind of off line, that's gonna go away anyway. It wouldn't hurt to say, are there any other changes? I mean, because we're still discussing well, that. Just no, I know don't talk wouldn't... about the foundation director. Are there any yeah. other changes people are interested in? And then pull the motion. Well, I I I know that, but I'm trying to get a sense of whether people want to get involved in for a lot of further discussions. That's my point. I, I don't think there'll be a lot, but yeah, I'm. Well, I'm Liz has something. That. Yes, I do. And I <laughs> We don't have to discuss it here. I just want to raise a couple of ideas or, or things um, for the the, uh, the policy committee or the bylaws committee to consider. There's nothing in here about attendance by a member. And I don't know whether that's been an issue in the past that you have a representative from a district that was not regularly attending meetings and that was problematic. Yes, Sheila. Liz, that is that is something that we're discussing. So you're right, and that is on the on a discussion board. Okay, so, that yes. was added into the bylaws. The well, second well, thing, yeah. The second thing is, and this is again, this is because I'm new, um, and I'm new in a COVID environment. But it just seems like the one year, uh, Miriam and Fran might say it feel differently, or anybody else who served as a chair in the past, but. It seems like the one year rotation of our officers is awfully quick. And 
to me, a two year rotation would be the person would just be able to get into a rhythm or the people would be get into a rhythm and then they would be able to, you know, settle in and by the end of the two years be a very experienced chair with the you know the other uh, uh, deputy i'm not sure if that's the right name jane but the deputy chair taking over would have it just seems like it would it's happening too quick and it could be because we haven't met in person and i'm new but i just wondered if the policy i mean the bylaws committee wanted to talk or has talked about or in the past, it didn't work very well to have two years. And I know there's one year option um, on our one year, but I just wondered if we wanted to make it a two year kind of a, a official um, role rather than just a one. So year. can I suggest that we'll we'll just take these comments back to the policy yeah. committee and not discuss them here? Right, that's what mm -hmm. I was hoping. No, I'd like to um, vote on the, uh, whether we're going to accept these as rewritten. So um, we've discussed it and ready to vote. Uh, all those in favor of accepting, all those opposed, opposed. We're not accepting it, we're sending it back. We're sending it back, yeah. Yeah, okay, yes, thank right. you. And now we'll move on to um, the round table. So let's start, um, we'll start with Brian. Brian. I'll go very quickly. Burke Center, Kings Park remain good. They're open most of the time. Once in a while, there's some uh, structural or heating <laughs> problems. Uh, the food for fines is going well, although I, I did talk to the branch manager at Burke Center, and it was a very slow start this year, and I don't know whether that's because of the COVID or what. It I uh, stopped by uh, earlier today, and it appeared to have picked up uh, well, so I would be interested in knowing how it looks across the whole system, Christine, but that's, you might be talking about that later. Are we, are we seeing people interested in that? Other than that, I think it's great, and I hope everybody has a really nice uh, holiday season. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Miriam? Just happy holidays to everybody. I'll pass. Okay, great. Jane? Stay safe and uh, go 2021. <laughs> Yay, Suzanne. Um, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Sujatha. Um, I did get a chance to go pick up my my uh, my uh, annual reports and visited with Herndon and had the whole plan to by the time of this meeting to have visited everywhere and my every one of my branches and my daughter came home and <laughs> had COVID. No, she guys. So we were all in quarantine here in the house. <laughs> I mean, she's fine, but that did ground me in the house. So these are really strange days, and they get in the way of getting things done. But it's okay. Everyone is well, so we're lucky. Okay, great, Sheila. And happy holidays to everyone. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Sheila. Happy holidays, everybody. Keith. Uh, same. Happy holidays. I yield the remainder of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Happy holidays. Thanks. Priscilla. I'll pass. Thank you. Thank you. Liz. Nothing but other than uh, best wishes for a great holiday season and a great new year. Thank you. Phil. Happy holiday to everyone. Thank you. Okay. And happy holidays from me. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. A second. Thank you. Any discussion on that? <laughs> Wait, good night. Liz, come on, help us out here. Okay, <laughs> all those in favor, say aye. Bye. 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 Good night. Okay, Christine. thank you for a lovely Bye. 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 Bye.